In this video, I'll do an overview of Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 2. Many of the feature sets will appeal to both on-premises administrators as well as to hosting providers. The Server 2016 operating system is designed to be smaller, faster, and more efficient than it was previously. One of the ways that this happens is that there is no longer a side-by-side -side folder on the hard disk when you install the product, whereby when you decide to install other roles and features in the future, it would pull them from that folder. Instead, you've got to specify the installation source whenever you decide to add one of these roles or features, so it takes less disk space. Server 2016 is also cloud optimized in terms of its roles and features, whether it's being used for a private or a public cloud solution. There are three installation options. With the default Server 2016 installation, we have a command prompt only, and of course, we've got PowerShell support. So it's similar to having Server Core in previous versions. We could also install Server 2016 with the local admin tools. This is the second installation option you'll see. This gives us a local GUI on the server. But Microsoft's strategy is such that we want to move away from supporting a GUI locally on the server. Instead, we manage servers remotely using GUI and command line tools. Now you can remove or add the local admin tools to either the default Server 2016 installation or, of course, the one we're talking about currently. There's a third option that isn't an installation option that you see when you boot from the product media, but we can install a nano server from a WIM that's supplied on the product media in the nano server folder. Now, we'd have to provision it as a VHD if we wanted to run it, for example, as a virtual machine. NanoServer is a headless operating system, which means that there's no way to locally interact with it at all, not even at the command line level, not even to log on locally. So we have to be careful about provisioning it initially so that we can reach it over the network. So it's designed to be managed exclusively over the network from command line tools as well as GUI tools. Let's take a look at each of the three interfaces for these installation options. What we're looking at here is the default server 2016 installation, whereby once we log in, we have a command prompt. But there is no graphical support by default. And again, this is the default installation option. The second installation option is to install Server 2016 with local admin tools, and what we end up with is a graphical desktop environment, where we've got the old style start menu, we've got Server Manager, File Explorer, PowerShell, and so on. However, this will use more resources than a server that doesn't support the graphical admin tools locally. And this is the nano server boot up screen. Even once it's completely finished booting, we don't get a login prompt or anything like that because NanoServer cannot be managed locally. So there's really no need then to work with the local interface or the lack of an interface with NanoServer. Server 2016 also introduces some changes to Active Directory domain services, one of which is Active Directory Security and Identity Management. This allows us to have a separate Active Directory forest for admin accounts. We can also configure time-based admin access. So for example, administrator would only have elevator privileges, perhaps to manage groups, for a period of time. With Active Directory Federation services, there is now support for authenticating users from an LDAP directory. So we're not limited to just authenticating users through Active Directory. We also have the option of using access control policies, which determine who is allowed to make a connection to a specific relying party trust. We could even limit it based on network or how they authenticate and so on. OAuth and OpenID support has now been built into Active Directory Federation services. And we also have the option of allowing device registration through Active Directory Federation services, along with Azure multi-factor authentication support. There are a number of Hyper-V improvements, including the fact that WinRM is now used for management which means it's more firewall friendly. We also have VM storage resiliency, whereby if a virtual machine can't connect to its shared network storage, instead of crashing as it did previously, it will suspend itself. And when it detects that that storage is available, it will automatically resume operations. 
We also have the option of working with shielded VMs, which is great for hosted environments. With shielded VMs, administrators of the host hypervisor server can start or stop the virtual machine, but they can't work with the configuration of it or anything within the running guest operating system. Hyper-V also introduces production checkpoints, which means that checkpoints, or what were formerly called snapshots in the past, are fully supported in production environments. Virtual machines can also add and remove network adapters and memory while the virtual machine is running. Server 2016, in all of its three installation options, automatically has Windows Defender running. So Windows Server Anti-Malware is included for free automatically. There are some improvements with remote desktop services in terms of support for OpenGL and OpenCL. This allows us to support higher-end graphics applications. For file and storage services, there are a number of new features, including quality of service policies that we could apply to a group of virtual machines instead of just a single VM. We also have data duplication that uses multi-threads, which makes it more efficient. And there's support for Storage Spaces Direct, which allows the use of local disk storage in a shared environment, and so on. Failover clustering now allows rolling upgrades. This means that we can upgrade cluster nodes with no downtime. The web application proxy allows for publishing and pre-authentication with Active Directory Federation services. This means that we can pre-authenticate to web apps. Windows PowerShell version 5 is now included with Server 2016. Some of the new features include ISC remote debugging of PowerShell code and also the formal creation of custom classes. In terms of networking changes, there is the introduction of the network controller role. This role, when installed, allows centralized management of network fabric items. This means we don't have to manually configure network devices like routers and switches and virtual machines and firewalls and so on. The network controller includes a module for PowerShell with a number of commandlets to manage it, but often we'll use a higher level graphical management tool. Generic routing encapsulation or GRE tunneling is also included. This allows us to establish point-to-point -point virtual links and it supports IPv4 and IPv6. IPAM, IP Address Management, was available in previous versions whereby, on a large-scale network, we could bring together our DNS and DHCP configurations. And we could also monitor how our IP address space was being used and how DNS zones were doing. We now have more DNS and DHCP configuration options available through IPAM. With DNS, there is now support for DNS policies. This means that we can create DNS policies that are criteria-based responses based on the client location, for example, the subnet they're on, or the time of day. So this means that, for example, clients on different subnets might query the DNS server for the same host but get a different IP address returned. There are also a number of new PowerShell commandlets for managing DNS. With DHCP, network access protection support has been removed. In this video, we did an overview of Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 2.